Oh shit, I wasn't filming. Ah ha ha! First time I've ever done that. Hello, Joseph here. I'm a musician, I'm a composer, and I love talking about music right here on this channel for your eyeballs to consume. Hector Berlioz was a very significant French Romantic composer. He did a load of crap in operas and ballets and concerts and all that, but what a lot of people don't know about is his possessive streak. Over the course of his life, he had quite a few lovers and courtesans, around which are a lot of dramatic stories. And that string of love and drama is what I'll be talking about today in this video. Please like the video, subscribe, share. Do people share? Do people share videos? Is that a thing people do? Also, consider donating to my Patreon. Uh, I know everybody has a Patreon nowadays, so I'm not pressed, but if you were to donate even the smallest amount, it would be really encouraging, and it would mean that I can continue making these videos long into the future. Let's go! Hector Berlioz was born on the 11th of December 1803. He was born to more practically inclined parents. His mother, as far as I can find, was a stay-at-home wife, but his father was a provincial doctor who worked in the commune of La Côte saint andre in southeastern France. Berlioz's father was a very respected figure in his community. He was an agnostic, which, after the many revolutions in France, was not actually that unusual, despite being 200 years ago. As a doctor, Berlioz's father was very progressive, and was actually the first European to work in and around the subject of acupuncture. Berlioz himself was not exposed to much music education as a child. His father didn't view it as a valid or acceptable career choice. Instead, wanting Berlioz to walk in his father's footsteps as a doctor, or perhaps as a lawyer if that failed. This is beginning to sound familiar. His childhood was spent reading books on geography and travel, and learning the classics. He recalled in his memoirs being moved to tears by Virgil's account of Dido and Aeneas, and he later began studies on anatomy at his father's request. And this leads us to his first love, Estelle. At the age of 12, Berlioz came across an 18-year-old woman named Estelle de Boeuf. Despite her being six years his senior, essentially an adult woman to his tween, he instantly was enamoured by her. She had an elegant high waist, large eyes ready for war, albeit always smiling, hair worthy of adorning Achilles' helmet, Feet, I, I will not say Andalusian, but rather pure-blooded Parisian. And pink lace boots, I had never seen such a thing. You laugh. Well, I have forgotten the colour of her hair. I think it was black, however. But I cannot think of her without seeing her pink lace boots sparkling in time with her big eyes. <laughs> This is some straight nonsense. Estelle would instantly, perhaps even unknowingly, become a muse for Berlioz. He devoted many of his early compositions to the woman. He wrote a melody for her to words from Estelle et Nemechin, which would later become the opening motif in his symphony fantastique. And he also devoted the idée fix for the same symphony to Estelle. Berlioz's obsession with his first love, Estelle, would remain as a thread throughout his entire life. Skip forward a decade to 1824. Berlioz had attended the University of Paris to study medicine at his father's request, but he hated every moment. The cutting up of dead bodies and the visceral grossness of medicine, especially at the time, was just too much for his dainty artistic sensibilities. Nonetheless, he had finished his degree and wanted to promptly forget all about it and pursue his true love of music. For two years, he would fuck about doing not much at all but composing, until 1826, when he would be admitted to the Paris Conservatoire to study composition. He would do a lot of crap there, wrote some music, sang at the theatre, won the Prix de Rome, the most famous French prize for music at the time, you know, unimportant shit. But what is important is that this would be where he would meet his second obsession, Harriet Smithson. Harriet Smithson was a very famous Shakespearean actress. She was born in Ireland in 1800 and from just age 14 would perform in various roles all across the British and Irish Isles. She would make her debut in London in 1818, playing the part of Letitia Hardy in The Bell Stratagem, a play about straight people doing yet more nonsense. This debut would kick off her career in touring theatre, which would bring her to Paris. She had been travelling as the leading lady in Charles Kemble's touring company, and eventually came to the Théâtre de l'Odéon to put on a show of Romeo and Juliet. 
At the same time, Berlioz, while studying at the Conservatoire, had attained a great interest in theatre, and in 1827 he would attend the play by Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. This play, despite Berlioz knowing literally zero English, would utterly change his life. It's lightning bolt. By opening up the heavens of art for me with a sublime din, cast light on the deepest depths. I have literally no idea what he's talking about. This was the first time that he had seen Shakespeare performed, and he found that Shakespeare's words, despite being completely unintelligible, really spoke to him. But what spoke to him even more was the leading lady on the stage, our very own Harriet Smithson. Berlioz became instantly obsessed with Harriet, to the point of stalking and harassing her. He constantly sent her letters, despite never having met her. For a short time, Berlioz even moved into an apartment near to where she was staying, close enough for him to see her return home and watch Watch her sleep. What the fuck? However, for years, Harriet Smithson would systematically reject Berlioz's advances, and he began to lose interest in her, quickly turning his crazy eye to a new woman, the teenager Marie Mock. Marie, a Belgian pianist, was 18 at the time, and she quickly became an infatuation for Berlioz. However, unlike prior Harriet Smithson and Estelle de Boeuf, <laughs> She reciprocated his advances, and they planned an engagement. However, before they could officiate the betrothal, Berlioz had to win over Marie's mother, Madame Mock. He decided to do so by attempting to win the coveted Prix de Rome, a prestigious prize for French music. After three attempts, he won the first prize, and this not only convinced Madame Mock of Berlioz's pedigree, but also finally convinced Berlioz's own father that music was a valid path to go down. So, Berlioz had won the Prix de Rome and was set to marry his beloved Marie, but one of the conditions of the prize was that winners had to study in Rome in the Villa Medici for two years. He gladly took the long journey there, but not even three weeks into study, Berlioz left the villa without telling anyone where he was going or for how long. He had learnt that his beloved Marie had ended their engagement, and was now going to marry the much richer and older Camille Playet, a big businessman in piano making. Berlioz, with his crazy obsessive brain, was was furious and planned to kill them both, along with Marie's mother, who he referred to as the Hippopotamus. Damn. He decided to go for the full James Bond and procured himself pistols and poisons to do the deed. His plan was to enter the Mox family home disguised as a maid, kill Marie, kill her mother, the Hippopotamus, kill Marie's future husband, and then shoot himself in the head. I thought I was a drama queen. Unsurprisingly, the plan fell through. On his way, he lost his maid outfit, and by the time he got to Nice, he realised what an idiot he was being, and returned to Rome. All this drama would eventually inspire Berlioz to write the symphony Lelio, a spiritual sequel to his famous Symphonie Fantastique, in which he affirmed the power of music over passion, and through which brings us back to Harriet Smithson. Smithson, up until this point, had rejected all of Berlioz's advancements. However, in 1832, she was invited by a friend to listen to Berlioz's Lelio. While at the concert, she realised that the symphony was about her, and she quickly met with Berlioz and they became lovers. For the next decade, Smithson and Berlioz would remain partners and then spouses, living in Paris and then Montmartre, which back then hadn't yet fused with the main Parisian city. Over time, Harriet Smithson's career began to deteriorate. She had seen no more success in France, and her husband's newfound celebrity was a great source of resentment for her. As a manifestation of this, she became possessive and then suspicious of her husband's fidelity. While Berlioz was busy travelling around Europe, Harriet's suspicions were confirmed, as her husband had in fact cheated on her, so much so that he had taken a mistress, a lady named Maria Recio. Berlioz had become bored of his wife, and this caused Harriet's health to deteriorate as she took to heavy drinking to cope with the grief. Berlioz separated from Harriet in 1844 after 11 years of marriage, but had to wait another 10 years for her to die so that he could then marry his mistress. Wow, what a twat. Then, after eight years of marriage to Maria, she died suddenly aged 48. Maria's mother survived her daughter and looked after Berlioz from then on. 
As a widower, Berlioz would have two last flings. In 1862, he would meet the mysterious Amelie, a young woman in the Montmartre Cemetery, a woman less than half his age and who we know almost nothing about, not even her second name. Their relationship lasted a year, and after they stopped meeting, Amelie mysteriously died aged 26. Berlioz was completely unaware of Amelie's death and would only find out after he came across her grave six months later. Obviously, the only explanation is that she was a ghost. The shock of this would prompt Berlioz, after decades of distance, to finally return to his first love of Estelle de Boeuf with her pink-laced boots, who was now a widow aged 67. After 50 years, she must have been very surprised to see Berlioz. The once infatuated 12-year-old now had the face of a haggard, late middle-aged man. Nonetheless, she met him kindly in 1864, and they visited one another in three successive summers. He wrote to her every month for the rest of his life. Berlioz's first love and inspiration would be his last, and only a few years later he would die aged 65, and would be buried alongside his wives Harriet Smithson and Maria Ressio. Which honestly is kind of fucked up because they hated each other, but it's the 19th century, people treated women like shit. If Berlioz existed nowadays, he would not be thought of nearly as fondly as we do hundreds of years later. He was passionate, but he was also a bit of a creep, and a criminal because he plotted murder. That's the thing, he was human. A deeply flawed human who did some very horrendous and scary things, but still human. It's actually quite a common thread for these romantic composers to have had tumultuous relationships with women. And I think it's more of a manifestation of the time period than of their particular profession. Nonetheless, these stories are interesting to me and they are stories worth telling. Thank you for watching the video. Please like, please subscribe and yeah, love you, bye.